So Revelation 6, 1. Then I saw when the Lamb broke one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying, as with a voice of thunder, Come. I looked, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. When he broke the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come. And another, a red horse, went out, and to him who sat on it was given, granted to take peace from the earth, and that men would slay one another, and a great sword was given to him. And when he broke the third seal, I heard the third living creature saying, Come. I looked, and behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard something like a voice in the center of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not change the oil in the wine. When the lamb broke the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come. I looked, and behold, an ashen horse, and he who sat on it had the name of death, and Hades was following with him. Authority was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword and with famine and with pestilence and by the wild beasts of the earth. When the Lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. And they cried out with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And there was given to each of them a white robe, and they were told that they should rest for a little while longer, until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren, who were to be killed even as they had been, would be completed also. I looked when he broke the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth made of hair, and the whole moon became like blood, and the stars of the sky fell to the earth, as a fig tree casts its unripe figs when shaken by a great wind. The sky was split apart like a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Then the kings of the earth and the great men and the commanders and the rich and the strong and every slave and free man hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and to the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who is able to stand? So we um, saw in our study um, leading up to the book of Revelation that Daniel in, in um, his presentation in Daniel chapter 9 gave us the 70th week of Daniel divided into two parts and then Jesus expanded that in Jesus all of the discourse his prophetic message in Matthew 24 24 4 to 14 and 16 to 28 and so on and now the book of Revelation is unfolding this same block of time and so what you have is this method of presenting the truth of something that's going to happen first in just kernel form and then in an abbreviated form here by Jesus and now it's laid out full-fledged in terms of what's going to take place during this 70th week of Daniel okay and so um, what Paul added is that the dead in Christ will rise first and then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together and so Paul brings to us the doctrine of the rapture that's not in any of Jesus' teachings. Jesus, when he talks about the coming of the Lord, is talking about the second coming here. It's not until we get into the epistles of Paul and the start of the church and the doctrine of the church that we have the teaching with regard to the rapture. So that gets confused by people sometimes, especially reading the Gospels. And Jesus talks about the fact that 
the day of the Lord is coming like a thief in the night and so forth. He's talking about this event. Then Paul develops the doctrine of the rapture later on. Now, this schematic becomes significant as we move into the book of Revelation, especially as we move into chapter 6 here. One other thing to look at as we move into chapter 6 is that Paul made the statement, in my judgment, he's talking about the rapture here, <coughs> when he said that no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come. The it, in the context of verses 1 and 2, is the day of the Lord. And the day of the Lord is a period of seven years plus the thousand years of the kingdom. All right? So the day of the Lord, he says, will not come unless the apostasy, and we saw that apostasy is a departure, unless a departure comes first. So the departure has to happen before the day of the Lord can begin. And then the man, and also that the man of lawlessness is revealed. So those two things, Paul says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, have to happen for the day of the Lord to start. So this is an event that we don't know when it's going to happen. This event with the re revealing of the man of sin is what we're about to see now as we move into Revelation chapter 6. And so that enables us to begin with the day of the Lord. Now, back to our chart that we've been working with. Remember that we have looked at it, this chart of the whole book of Revelation, and um, we reminded ourselves of the timing that is provided by Jesus in this revelation of all of these uh, three and a half year markers. What we're looking at today is back over here as we begin with the seal judgments in Revelation chapter 6, just so you're oriented in terms of where we are, okay? So, the seven seals are recorded for us in Revelation 6 and 7. These seals on the scroll that the Lamb, the risen Lamb, Jesus, has taken out of the hand of the Father. We saw in chapter 5 that the Father is sitting on the throne, and in his right hand is this book or scroll with the seven seals. John began to weep because there was no one qualified to open the book. And then, then as the scene unfolds, the Lamb steps forward in this inner circle next to the Father and takes the book or the scroll out of the hand of the Father. And now he begins to open this. And that's what initiates then this period called the Tribulation, also known as the Wrath of the Lamb. So artists have tried to render him because what John says is I saw a lamb standing as if slain but he also is called the lion of the tribe of Judah and so uh, this artist has tried to depict those things. We don't know exactly what Jesus looked like. He obviously was not he, he was not a lamb but, uh, but he's seen as a lamb in that scene in heaven. Then we read in 6.1 Then I saw when the Lamb broke one of the seven seals and I heard the four living creatures saying as with a voice of thunder, Come! And I looked and behold a white horse and he who sat on it had a bow and a crown was given to him and he went out conquering and to conquer. Now the rider on the white horse there's another rider on the white horse, right? In the book of Revelation. <clears throat> when we get to chapter 19. They're not the same. This rider on the white horse <clears throat> is given a bow <clears throat> at the very beginning of this um, time of judgment on the earth. And it says, the bow was given to him and he went out conquering and to conquer. So he, he conquers, he gains dominion over part of the earth and he is seeking to conquer the entire earth. And so this is, in my judgment, the Antichrist. He's, we're not told that it's the Antichrist here. But that fits with what Paul said when he said two things have to happen for the day of the Lord to begin. Those two things are the departure, uh, rendered apostasy in our translations, the departure of the church and the revealing of the lawless one, the revealing of the man of sin. So the breaking of the first seal sends this rider on a white horse 
Now, why is he a rider on a white horse? Because he's seen that way. Because he's seen that way, correct, right? If you were going to uh, counterfeit money, what color would you print it? Green. Why would you print it in green? So it would look like the real thing, right? So when the Antichrist comes, he comes as a rider on a white horse because he is attempting to look like the Christ. He is attempting to look like Jesus. And he's going out to conquer and to deceive the entire earth. And so that's the first seal that's broken. Then um, we have a second seal that's broken. <clears throat> With the breaking of the second seal on the scroll, we have a rider on a red horse. And it's given him to take peace from the earth. So somehow this individual that John sees is symbolic. The main idea is the taking away of peace. And so there's going to be warfare on the earth during these days. So as the rider on the white horse is attempting to gain control of the earth, this rider on the red horse is saying that nations are going to be fighting against one another. And I think what we see now with a war in Ukraine and a war in Israel, and who knows what else is going on in other places like in Nigeria and and Liberia and so forth, <clears throat> there'll be many more <coughs> battles and much more warfare going on in those days <clears throat> as people will um, seek to fight with one another and gain control and so forth. And so what is being announced to John as he sees this is that this time is going to be characterized by warfare. Now, do you remember what Jesus said in Matthew 24? He said there will be wars and rumors of wars. Okay? So that fits here. We're at the beginning of this 70th week, and we have the revealing of the man of sin, and we have Jesus' words, there are going to be wars and rumors of wars. So the rider on the red horse brings warfare on the face of the earth during these days. Then we have the rider on the black horse that's introduced to us. Yes, Dave? Is the white horse guy already here? Is he already here? Because the, because you're saying about the red horse is warfare. Yeah. So the, That's a good question. How many say he's already here? How many say he's not already here? How many say I don't know? <laughs> uh, you're in good company when you say I don't know. The answer is we don't know. Um, probably, since, since the evil one does not know when the rapture is going to occur, and he doesn't know when Jesus is going to start to break the seals, there's probably in every generation someone who could be utilized as the Antichrist. And so that's why you have prophetic writers and Bible teachers and so forth who say at one point it was Hitler, at another point it's somebody else, and then it was Kissinger, and then it was others down through the years. It seems to me there probably is always someone that could be utilized. Could it be um, Vladimir Putin? Could be, I don't know. Um, so there's probably someone available. Is it the Antichrist? The answer is we don't know. It could be another 500 years before the rapture takes place. I'm actually hoping it's sooner than that. I don't know about you, but I would rather be raptured than to have to go through. Right after a good lunch. Right after a good lunch. All right. So we don't know when that's going to take place. Uh, what we do know is that somehow that person is going to be granted... Um, worldwide acclaim of some kind. That person is going to be brought to the forefront. He's going to be introduced to the world. My guess is that he will be introduced to the world as someone with a solution to all the world's problems. So if you had somebody who appeared on the scene today and said, I have a solution to the Arab-Israeli problem and also I have a solution to the problem of, of hunger and so forth around the face of the earth, the whole earth would flock to that individual. 
And that's what he's seeking to do, is to bring everybody under his control. What's interesting is, as soon as that happens, the rider on the red horse is introduced and warfare breaks out. And so he is unable to consolidate everything as he would wish. And that reminds us of the old adage that there's uh, no honor among thieves, right? And so when you have all of these unbelievers who are, they're trying to be brought under the control of one unbeliever, they just struggle <laughs> and fight against each other. I remember re reading years ago, a little off the subject, but reading years ago about the date that the nation of Israel was de declared their independence in 1948. And then the very same day or next day as it was, the Arab nations declared war on Israel. And they could easily have overrun and wiped them out if they could have worked together. But one thing the Arab nations have never been able to do is to work together to accomplish anything. And as a result of that, there's this inherent weakness that's built in. And we see it even now as the nation of Israel is trying to walk a picket fence in the midst of all of these issues. So uh, <clears throat> that's what's gonna happen here. Then the rider on the black horse appears, and the rider on the black horse is gonna destroy all of the grain of the earth. I don't know exactly how that's gonna happen, but that suggests <coughs> one of the answers that the rider on the white horse is gonna bring is some sort of supernatural production of grain to feed the people on the earth. That's a major issue in so many parts of the world, is having enough to eat. And so if the rider on the white horse brings a solution to that, some super crop, sorry. as has been, um, <laughs> as, <laughs> sorry? Cream of wheat, did you say? Yeah. 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 Soy and cream. I said soy People know that. Oh, oh yeah. They eat. Yeah, okay. okay. So, so that suggests then that God's gonna defeat that. So whatever the Antichrist tries to do, God is, is uh, causing the people on the earth to, to fight against that. So we have this famine that takes place. Now, it says in the, the decree comes from within the four living creatures, not the four living creatures, but from within them, inside of them, so that decree comes from the Father who's sitting on the throne. That a quart of wheat is, a, is sold for a denarius. Now, how much is a quart of wheat? Think of a quart jar, you know, it's about yay big, right? A quart jar that's full of wheat would have four cups, right? Four cups to a quart. When you, when you take that wheat and grind it, you get a little bit more in terms of flour because it expands, a little bit more in flour. In the, in the ancient world, at least on one site I read, um, normally a quart of wheat was about what was necessary for one person for a day. Um, if you went the cheaper route and you went to barley, you could get three quarts. So if you're single during the tribulation, you would have a quart of wheat. If you're married and have a family, you would have to go with barley because now you have to, two or three or four mouths to feed. Now, how much is that quart of wheat? All right, it's a denarius, it's a day's wage. So that means that your day's wage, whatever that is, you break it down. You take your salary and you break it down and you have a day's wage. That day's wage would basically buy one loaf of bread. That's how expensive it's going to be at this time. And so that, so that is decreed by God as what's gonna happen on the earth. So God is bringing judgment on the earth, in spite of the fact that the Antichrist is seeking to take over and rule the earth, right? Then we come to the rider on the white, uh, on the pale horse or ashen horse, as the case may be. And he's followed, he's, his name is Death, and he's followed by Hades, and he is given authority to kill one quarter of the earth's population. So I checked yesterday on the web, uh, the, the Earth's population, and world population was estimated at 8,102,000,000 people. So, 
this process is going to destroy how many people? Two and a half. Two billion. About two billion people, right? So about two billion people are going to die in the process of these seals being unleashed on the earth. So that suggests a little bit of time taking place. You have, a little, you have to have a little bit of time for warfare. You have to have a little bit of time for the famine to take over. So we don't know how long. It doesn't tell us how long it takes for the playing out of these seals. But my guess is you're looking at six months or maybe a year, something like that, as these things are unfolded by Jesus on the planet. So when you think about two billion people compared to the United States, we're like a drop in a bucket. This is the latest numbers here. Oh, that's supposed, they're supposed to be in this year. It's supposed to be in here. Um, 326 million estimated in the U.S. Okay. So that brings us then. Oh, uh, <coughs> throw a couple of pictures up here. A couple of people have tried in various pieces of artwork to depict these four horsemen as they come um, and are unleashed on the earth. Um, different ways of trying to just give us a visual to grasp. Um, the main thing to understand is it's going to be a destructive time. But in the midst of the destruction, when the fifth seal is broken, what we read with the fifth seal is a picture of all of these slain individuals who are under the altar in heaven. And these are the martyrs from the early part of the tribulation. And so what God is doing at the same time is apparently giving another opportunity to people who yes. will respond to the gospel, who will respond to the truth of his word. These are, these are individuals who are under the altar. Uh, here's an artist's rendering of who knows what it looks like. They're saying, how long, O oh Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? So these folks have been slain by people on the earth, by unbelievers, the Antichrist and warfare and so forth, and they're in heaven. They're under this altar in heaven. Remember last time we talked about how there's a temple in heaven. And uh, under this altar in heaven, we have all of these individuals, and we read in the text of Second Eating, and we read in the text, there was given to each of them a white robe, and they were told that they should rest for a little while longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who were to be killed, even as they had been, would be completed also. So what that says to us is, is that God has a bigger agenda than just avenging the death of martyrs. A bigger agenda than always dealing immediately with our suffering and with our pain. That God has a bigger picture in mind. And so what Revelation, one of the things Revelation does is to help us to see something of that bigger picture and to understand that God is about glorifying himself. He will, he will judge them. That becomes clear as we move through the book. He will judge these people who need to be judged, but he's not quite ready to do it yet. Are they part of the two billion then? The quarter? Uh, probably some of them are. Yeah. We lose a quarter of the Earth's population during this first series of judgments. Then when we get to the trumpets, there's another quarter and so forth as we move through. So, um, so yeah, they would be probably some of them. And it's a, it's a huge number of people who are there in heaven. Okay. How do we know that they are previous martyrs? Okay, because they have not been resurrected yet, A, and B, because of what's said in the next chapter. The next chapter tells us that these are the ones who have come out of the Great Tribulation. All right? That's a good question. And are they Jewish or mixed? Or? Um, probably a mixture. We don't know at this point yet exactly what they will be. All we know is that it's a great number of folks who died because of the 
the word of God, we're told, because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they maintained. So they stood up for the truth of God's word, and they were they were slaughtered because of that. So whether whether it's the Antichrist who does it, or whether it's in the warfare, uh, how it happens exactly, we're not told at this point. Okay. That brings us then to the sixth seal. The sixth seal is a is a conglomerate of uh, natural catastrophes or natural disasters that which happen. Um, where it said there are earthquakes, there are famines, the, um, the sun becomes dark. Uh, interesting that we have an eclipse, right? <laughs> you can look at this eclipse and it won't bother your eyes. <laughs> um, the moon becomes red like blood. The stars are falling from the heavens. So all of this stuff that we see about asteroids and stars falling and so forth, it's going to happen when God allows the earth to sort of begin to crumble and break up a little bit. And we we then read that all of the kings of the earth and the military commanders, the, the uh, rich, the strong, uh, all of those who are significant people on the earth hide themselves in the mountains and in the rocks and they and they say to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come and who is able to stand? Now, when we come in next time, when we get into chapter 7, we have, to, we have to deal with this a little bit in terms of there are some folks who say that this statement, the great day of their wrath has come, means that we're in the second half of the tribulation. I think it's just an announcement that the that the wrath of God has begun. Um, that what we are finding is is that God, Jesus is unleashing this wrath on the earth, and that the people on the earth soon recognize that the wrath of God is being poured out. One interesting thing: we have the wrath here that's mentioned in these verses uh, is in First Thessalonians chapter five, verse nine it makes it very clear that we are not appointed to wrath, but to deliverance. And so that reinforces for me the fact that the rapture is going to take place before this begins. Right? So, chapter 6 takes us through six of the seals that are broken and initiates then, it probably covers the first six months to a year, maybe as much as a year and a half or so, of this seven year period. When we come back to chapter seven, we have to see what else takes place and then that introduces us to the trumpet judgments and that takes the rest of the first half, as far as I can tell. We'll talk more about the timing of these things as we get into that. Any other questions this morning? So you asked with the white horse coming, has he, is he here on the earth today? No, because uh, we haven't been uh, raptured, right? Well, the individual could be here, just not presented, oh, not introduced. Oh, okay, here and we're raptured tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. Okay. We just don't, we don't know. Okay, Father, thank you for laying out for us what's going to happen. And thank you that um, we won't be here. That you're going to bring wrath and judgment on the earth in accordance with what has already been laid out in great detail. The whole plan is not some mishmash. It's, it's something that you have decreed. You have, you're holding on to it right now. You have that book in your right hand. And at the appropriate time, you're going to hand it to Jesus. And he's going to start your wrath and your judgment here on this earth. Help us, Lord, as we live in the less than ideal circumstances, as we deal with, with some really crazy stuff in our world, in our lives, both physically in the challenges that we face, but also politically and nationally and family-wise as we deal with all sorts of things. Help us to live in the light of the fact that your perfect plan will be unfolded 
at the right time in the right way. It's all been determined and we can rest in you. Help us, Lord, as we walk with you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>